America, and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on the country of Finland, a longtime U.S. ally and strategic partner. Our guest is Kai Zauer, Under Secretary of State for Foreign and Security Policy since 2019. Zauer joined the Finnish Foreign Ministry in 1995 and has served in Croatia, Kosovo, and Austria. Zauer was appointed ambassador to Indonesia, Timor Leste, and ASEAN in 2010. And in 2014, he became permanent representative of Finland to the United Nations. He has been appointed as Finland's next ambassador to Germany, taking up his post in Berlin later this year. For centuries, Finland has sat between competing empires. Modern-day Finland remained under Swedish control until Russia's victory in the 1808-1809 Russian-Swedish War, after which Russia designated the Grand Duchy of Finland as autonomous within the Russian Empire. Finland retained its Lutheran religion and official language, and acquired its own central government and bank. Finland declared independence in December 1917, amid the Russian Revolution, but almost immediately found itself enmeshed in a violent civil war. Almost 36,000 people died. The republic persisted, and Finland maintained its democracy. The Soviet Union invaded Finland on November 30, 1939. Despite fierce Finnish resistance, the Soviet army won the so-called Winter War, the first of three wars that Finland endured during World War II. In the Second, or Continuation War, Finland fought to protect itself from Soviet annexation and aligned with the Axis powers from 1941 until 1944. That year marked the Lapland War, in Finland's northernmost Lapland region between Finland and Nazi Germany following Finland's armistice with the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom. The Paris Peace Treaties established Finland's new borders. Finland maintained its independence and democracy throughout the post-World War II period, despite Soviet pressure. Finland gradually joined the international organizations created in the wake of the war to preserve international security and prosperity including the United Nations, the Nordic Council, and the International Monetary Fund. Finland played an instrumental role in the creation of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Following the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, Finland completed its political and economic integration with the West, joining the European Union in 1995. Finland and the United States grew into strong political, economic, and defense partners. In 1994, Finland joined the NATO Partnership for Peace program. And in 2014, Finland became a NATO Enhanced Opportunities Partner, the alliance's most meaningful tier of partnership. In 2016 and 2018, Finland and the U.S. signed statements of intent to bolster defense readiness, exchange information, coordinate strategy, and strengthen military capabilities. In 2021, Finland decided to acquire F-35s to replace its F-18 fleet, deepening the defense cooperation between the two countries that began in 1992. After Russia's 2022 reinvasion of Ukraine, Finland requested to join NATO, and NATO members granted membership in April 2023. Finland will provide important capabilities and geostrategic advantages vital to countering Russian aggression and restoring and preserving peace in Europe. Finland's relatively small population of 5.5 million and its 1,340-kilometer border with Russia have impelled the country to develop a robust defense capability, including large, well-trained reserve forces and the ability to mobilize the country quickly in time of crisis. We welcome Secretary Sauer today to discuss the war in Ukraine, Finland's priorities in the areas of defense and the economy, 
digital and energy security, and the future of Europe and the transatlantic relationship. Kai Zauer, welcome to Battlegrounds. It is great to see you again, and great to have you on this program uh, at, at, a, at a critical time. And so, hey, hey, good to see you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, HR. Good to be at Stanford. Yeah. Great. Well, we have, we have so much to talk about, but of, of course, a lot's happened in the la in, across the last year when I saw you last. We have, obviously, you know, Finland as, as a member uh, of NATO bringing a tremendous amount of capabilities, but just recently we heard the, the main roadblock to Sweden's accession to NATO has been removed. We have the Ukraine war going on. I want to talk about that and energy security and food security. But, but first, I'd just like to, to ask you, you know, what is your perspective on European security from Finland's perspective? What do you think our viewers need to know at the very top of this uh, discussion? Well, thanks, HR. Uh, I think I, I would still start uh, with uh, something uh, which is connecting Finland to to President Hoover, since we have the Hoover Institution here. I think it was in 1931 when President Hoover, he gave a, a debt uh, uh, relief uh, after the, the Great Depression. And it uh, was uh, supposed to be a, a temporary debt yeah. relief. But most of the countries who, 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 who were uh, like benefiting from it, they took it's a permanent one, with the exception of Finland which continued uh, uh, servicing its debt until it was all, all paid. And this is actually something which really shaped the, the uh, American perception of, of Finland uh, in the U.S. at that, that time. So just as a bit of a background. Uh, but uh, coming to your question, um, February 24th, uh, 2022 was for us... Uh, Probably something similar, the 9-11 was uh, to the United States. Uh, and of course, for viewers, this is the reinvasion of Ukraine uh, exactly. by, by Russia, the massive yeah. reinvasion. Yes, uh, when, when um, Russia unlawfully uh, attacked uh, Ukraine. So it um, made us to reevaluate uh, our security environment. Um, this was a case where a permanent member of the UN Security Council had attacked uh, a neighbor, a sovereign uh, a country, Ukraine, and by this uh, violated uh, the rules-based international order, which has basically been the protection of uh, small countries like, like ours. So against this background, uh, we had to consider uh, what to do. And uh, our decision, also supported by a, a strong uh, popular opinion, was to uh, seek uh, NATO membership. And, uh, well, this was done uh, very much uh, in conjunction with, with Sweden, uh, our, our good neighbor. Yeah. And it happened quite rapidly. It was a big change. I mean, I remember you know, just the, the term Finlandization, right, which was a synonym for neutrality. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it was a, a massive change. And it was decisive, wasn't it? Could you maybe explain a little bit about the political process, what happened inside of Finland that, that brought, uh, brought about this, this significant change in Finland policy? Yeah. I think first I, I, I digress a little bit, but since you mentioned uh, Finlandization, I think that's a term which is actually describing how a small <coughs> country next to a, a bigger country with uh, you know, totalitarian or expansive mm -hmm. ambitions, uh, how, how to survive next to uh, such an entity. And there are also other examples uh, in, in Europe, like Denmark and Germany b during the Second World War, before the Second World War. But um, uh, the process uh, indeed was, was quite uh, rapid. Uh, I think in the history of uh, NATO's enlargements, ours was the fastest uh, one. It took less than a year, although it could have been uh, uh, faster. Uh, but our Turkish and Hungarian uh, partners, uh, they needed some, some more time. Um, and um, it was also, I mean, the decision itself was very much uh, uh, supported by a strong uh, popular um, support and increased uh, support uh, to NATO membership, which manifested itself also in a, a convincing uh, a parliamentary uh, majority. Uh, the Finnish parliament has uh, 200 MPs, 
188 uh, of them were in favor of uh, NATO membership. So, so it's a huge uh, statistic. I think it's important for everyone to know that it wasn't it wasn't close at all. It was it was quite decisive. And and so I, I'm I'm a very enthusiastic about Finland as a new member of NATO because of the tremendous capabilities Finland brings to the alliance. The alliance, in my view, is much, much stronger with Finland than without Finland. Could you maybe talk to our viewers what you see as the, the major strengths that Finland brings to the alliance? Yes, I, I'll, I'll do that briefly. And uh, I divide it in, in maybe four or five uh, categories. So I would start with the uh, capabilities and their military capabilities and human uh, capabilities. Uh, military capabilities, just as an example, um, a year and a half ago, uh, Finland uh, made the political decision about its uh, largest ever uh, military procurement, which uh, was uh, F-35 uh, decision. I mean, we, we are flying the F-18s uh, now. Uh, it's time for an upgrade. So we organized a tender and uh, decided that uh, F-35s would be the next uh, generation for us. And uh, we have a very uh, you know, strong uh, artillery. I think the war in, in Ukraine has uh, shown how, how important uh, uh, the artillery is, uh, unfortunately. So uh, this combined with uh, also a uh, Navy reform uh, program, I think we, we have a you know, pretty strong uh, hardware uh, set or to toolbox at our disposal. Uh, besides that, there's a human factor. We are one of the few uh, countries left in, in, in Europe, uh, maybe even worldwide with the conscription service, which means that we can mobilize a significant reserve. In the first instance, uh, 280,000, and in the second instance, about 900,000, which would probably mean that I, I had to uh, <laughs> be activated as, as, as well. And the, the additional factor is that uh, we have also the very you know, strong defense uh, mindset. Uh, according to the surveys, uh, about 80% of those of the Finns uh, would be ready to take up uh, arms in defense of the, the country, which is also a very rare uh, quality in, in Europe uh, these, these days. So this is uh, the hardware, uh, human, humanware uh, uh, factor. And then, you know, other qualities, uh, geography. Uh, Finland is a country stretching. Uh, well, if you look at the, the map of Finland, it's the shape of a, of a woman, uh, actually. So the, the top, uh, the head of the, the lady uh, stretches up into the Arctic and the toes then the Baltic uh, Sea. So we are a bridge between the Arctic and the Baltic. And I think with the importance of the Arctic uh, uh, growing, uh, strategic importance, addition of Finland and Sweden to NATO is, is also uh, a balancing factor uh, for, for the alliance. Uh. Then we have uh, technology. Um, Finland and Sweden, both, both high-tech uh, countries. And uh, actually with the enlargement uh, to Finland and Sweden, uh, two out of three uh, global five and 6G providers will move uh, you know, in the remit of, 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 of NATO. And just for our viewers, just the 5 and 6G communications, hardware and equipment that's mm -hmm. necessary to, you know, to, to bring automation, really, to, to bring high-speed internet uh, yes. internationally. And, of course, the big competitors from the Chinese Communist Party, Huawei, which uh, is a, a large security concern. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this is a huge dimension of it that, that I hadn't put together. Obviously, Ericsson and Nokia. Yeah, uh, from Sweden and and uh, and Finland. I mean, they are not joining physically not NATO, NATO, but the, right, kind right. of the <laughs> yeah. But that yeah, security, eco, but our but ecosystem the will, will will right. come with the uh, tech ecosystem will join with the uh, with the country. And then my my last uh, observation uh, would would be also uh, a certain you know responsibility and predictability. I mean, as a NATO member, uh, we will continue uh, trying to be a predictable and s stable uh, actor in our kind of region. Huh? So we are not uh, out to provoke. Uh, we are there to stabilize. Huh? Yeah. You know, F Finland participated for the first time in NATO's annual war games and, and uh, simulations. 
And uh, any any other thoughts on on strategically what Finland is most concerned about? You mentioned the Arctic already and the competition with Russia, who's trying to lay claim, and now China, really, who has no claim from a ge- geographic perspective, is also uh, quite active in the Arctic. But what are what are Finland's main concerns? We're all concerned, obviously, and we'll talk more about about the war in in Ukraine, a uh, war against Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but what other security concerns does does Finland have? Uh, uh, besides, as you look to the east, yeah, no, I think uh, the the east is our primary concern. The Russian aggression on, on Ukraine through the existing uh, European sac- security architecture out of out of balance. Uh? Uh, so that is that is the most uh, important concern. And um, I think uh, if you look at the global uh, scale, uh, there are many. Kind of immaterial or thematic uh, concerns uh, like uh, uh, climate uh, change, uh, food uh, security, uh, diseases, uh, like pandemics, etc., et which uh, would deserve more attention and and uh, resources. But now our focus is so much on on, on uh, Russia and Ukraine. We've been distracted. Our resources are, are distracted. Our political attention is distracted uh, from these much more important, uh, you know, conf- conflicts or, or potential, um, you know, strategic uh, challenges. Uh, and I think this is something very important to to understand that uh, it is not uh, because of of us. Who are defending uh, Ukraine and uh, you know, criticizing Russia for for their unlawful aggression, uh, but the blame for 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 uh, no, um, is, is ha- has to be laid at uh, at the Russian doorstep. Uh? Absolutely, but because of them we cannot uh, provide uh, the necessary at- attention to the big uh, thematic uh, problems. Well, Kai, you know, your, your government has struggled for a long time with political subversion, various forms of aggression that Russia uses really to, to, to try to accomplish objectives below the threshold of, 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 a, of a military operation or, or what might elicit a, a military response. And, and, there, and there, you have a center uh, in Finland for, for excellence on hybrid warfare. Uh, what, what has Finland learned about defending kind of having a whole of society defensive yeah. approach uh, against uh, Russia's disinformation, cyber-enabled information warfare, and other forms of political subversion. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And uh, to counter hybrid and and cyber uh, threats, uh, you need to be uh, technically equipped. Uh, you have to have the the, the protection, uh, uh, technical protection or technological protection. But you have to have also uh, kind of. Uh, intellectual uh, <laughs> uh, protection. And this is something we have understood. Um, and we have a very strong uh, you know, ed- education uh, system in Finland. It has been ranked uh, very high in the, the PISA uh, studies. Uh, so what we have done is uh, we have used uh, the education system already at the primary school to teach uh, kids uh, media literacy. So to distinguish between uh, right and, and false uh, information. So I think uh, this is part of our you know, resistance uh, uh, also and resilience uh, in, in countering hybrid uh, threats. It is, I, I just uh, uh, finished my, my thought here. I think it's easier for us to do that because we have a, we have a small country, a homogeneous uh, country. And one thing is probably that language uh, protects us as well. Sure. Right? Finnish yeah. is impossible for anybody else to, <laughs> to, to, to speak. Right. Uh? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's, it, you make a really important point on education because uh, what, what Russia, I think, tries to do is, is polarize our society, pit us against each other, and diminish our confidence in, in who we are, our common identity as Americans or as Finns or, uh, or, or maybe our faith even in alliances and, and the transatlantic relationship. And, and education, I think, is the most important defense against that. We both have elections coming up next year, Finland and, mm-hmm. and the United States. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and of course, Russia will be quite active, right, in, mm-hmm. in terms of uh, sowing conspiracy theories. You know, the the vast majority of, of Russian activity 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in the U.S. from a cyber-enabled information yeah. warfare perspective is on issues of race, to polarize on race mm-hmm. or border control mm-hmm, and immigration mm-hmm, or on gun control, issues that already tend to divide yeah. Americans somewhat, and they try to use them to divide uh, us even further. Is Have you seen that in Finland as well? You mentioned some of the strengths in Finland, right? Uh, I mean, a relatively small scale problem in terms of population, uh, but also the homogeneity, homogeneity of, the, of the population and language. But but uh, what do you think were some of the best practices that uh, that might be able to be scaled up here in the United States? Yeah, um, I think it's it's simply awareness, um, awareness and uh, re- readiness and uh, resilience. But um, I think um, in in the U.S. it might be more more difficult uh, because. Uh, this is, and uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, uh, it's a more or less equal uh, uh, society. The social uh, cohesion is perhaps not as, as strong as uh, in small and uh, homogeneous uh, Finland where everybody pays a lot of taxes. Uh, so. Right. There, there are certain <laughs> short, short. Hey, we're, we're in California. <laughs> I mean, we pay a lot of taxes. In oh, California. you do? Okay. We just don't get as much for our taxes as you get in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, I think I think one of the great strengths of America, obviously, is we've always come from, I mean, you can't really point out uh, many Americans who, who originated here besides our Native American population. Yeah. So yeah. it has been our strength, yeah. but it's something yeah. obviously to be cognizant of. And, and I think, you know, every time we talk about things that divide us, we should maybe spend a little bit of time yeah. talking about what we can agree on and, exactly. and what's yeah. important about yeah. our common yeah. identity. No, that's- that's true. May, may I just add one, sure. one thought to your, your question? Because I think maintaining um, economic uh, stability uh, means also social uh, stability. So economic uh, prosperity uh, results into social stability. And I think here we are um, on a kind of a, yeah, un- unsure uh, ground or in, insecure ground uh, with the ongoing uh, crisis uh, because we have suffered from in, inflation sure. uh, there has been unemployment and all this comes after pandemic of course so right. so it's a kind of a very uh, fragile uh, economic environment and people sense that and they tend to then uh, make political choices which are more Maybe extreme, uh, either left or, or, or right. Uh, sure. Yeah. And I think this is something which can also be exploited uh, from from the outside. Right. I mean, right. if you're talking about hybrid uh, influence, yeah. and you already alluded yeah. to this already, I yeah. think you know what what Russia has done is Russia has completely you know caused this crisis, mm-hmm. caused the horrors and mm-hmm. and the suffering of the Ukrainian people, but also global suffering. And, and we've seen in the the failure to renew the grain deal recently Absolutely. and. And uh, and then continued threats to energy security mm-hmm. uh, that that uh, that have helped drive uh, in, inflation inter- internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Russia likes to try to blame everyone else for yeah. for these problems, as if it was if it was NATO who who uh, who caused the war, uh, or or who caused the energy crisis, or who caused the food shortage. And I think it's important for us to trace you know these grieve th- th- these terrible conditions back to the Russians yes. who actually caused them. And in the area of energy security, what what did Finland do? Because Finland was an example, right? Germany, I think, will now admit, obviously, mm-hmm. that that Germany made a big mistake mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. in giving Russia coercive power over its economy because of over reliance on natural gas, cheap natural gas from Russia. Yeah. Uh, what did Finland do differently? And what's the lesson that could be applied to energy security yeah. going forward? I mean, what what yeah. should be our priorities in in, that, yeah. in this arena? I think. Uh... In Finland, we are either a bit slow or uh, very strategic, uh, <laughs> because uh, after the the Cold War, uh, you know, Fukuyama, uh, Californ- Californian, right, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> right here, and, uh, with, the, yeah. with its, my colleague here at Stanford, right, right. 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 So we are kind and, of, and, and what, you're, what you're alluding to is this this thesis of the end of history, right? End that, of history. That democracy yes. was was going to be the final form of governance. Now he he qualified that to, to Frank's defense, yes. But but the interpretation of it was an over overly optimistic view of the, of the future yes. of governance and and, yes. and democratic governments and governance in particular. Exactly. So what we did, um, we we missed uh, the train of uh, optimism, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
We maintain. Well, I, think when it's, I think when it's cold yeah. and dark, maybe it's it's an important corrective to that optimism. <laughs> well, we and it resulted in us uh, maintaining our military capabilities, and actually we we even uh, reinforced them uh, after the Cold War when uh, Germany also dismantled uh, a lot of its um, uh, artillery and um, especially the Eastern German one. Uh, we we went shopping, so we we got a lot of uh, le- uh, uh, yeah artillery and then leopards and uh, so we we scaled up and uh, the same idea uh, basically also applies to our energy policy. So what we are doing, we are not putting all our you know, eggs in in one basket. Uh, we imported uh, some energy, oil and gas from from Russia, but not all of it. Uh, we have. Uh, we have nuclear energy, we have uh, high, hydro, hydro energy, wind energy, and we have a very good uh, Nordic uh, grid. So in, in case we have shortages, Norway uh, or, or Sweden, uh, they can compensate for, for, for that. So our energy portfolio is rather diverse. This is not the case with uh, all Europeans. We have uh, countries like Hungary, which is very um, you know, dependent. Uh, and and others as well, and it depends a little bit uh, not only on the political choices but also on, on geography, how how connected you are, right. how the pipelines, uh, That's pipelines right. the old, are the old running. infrastructure exactly right. yeah. Infra- right. infrastructure yeah. whether you are landlocked or not. I mean Germany is uh, building the LNG terminals uh, yes. now right. at, at the coast, right. uh, the regasification yeah. right, terminals and, and also also uh, uh, wind uh, yeah. uh, offshore wind energy, right. which right. all countries cannot do. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was a big mistake, I think, also to cancel nuclear. I mean, I, I think Finland has sidestepped that as well. I mean, it's it's difficult to cancel nuclear, jump to renewables, yeah, uh, w- without uh, continued continued um, investment in some old, you know, more traditional or hydrocarbon infrastructure. I think maybe that's one of the biggest lessons. But can I ask you what what you think about about Russia's next steps in in the aggression against Ukraine and the aggression really against the West broadly in terms of you know, using energy for course of purposes, yeah. now using food for course of purposes. There was the, the explosion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which mm-hmm. happened, I, I don't think, not with a, it was not a coincidence yeah. that that was the same day that the Norway, Finland, Poland pipeline opened. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, what's next? What do, you, what do you think we ought to be concerned about in terms of the trajectory of Russian aggression? Yeah, I'm. I'm not following the the military events on the daily basis. I mean, it's a very kind of uh, fluctuating and dynamic uh, situation. Uh, we are in the phase where where Ukraine is launching the counteroffensive. Um, they are very conscious that they have to save uh, human lives, uh, their own own ones. Uh, they're and, trying to and, they're uh, probing. They're trying to find a. I think an area of weakness now. To, yeah. To get through these these layered defenses behind exactly. multiple yeah. minefields and entrenchments and and uh, and deliberately prepared defensive positions by the yes yeah. yes I mean I, I I read some reports about uh, the mines uh, and uh, it's simply terrible huh? yeah yeah so we are in this this phase and uh, I think how how this phase will will end uh, or progress will very much also determine what what Russia's next uh, move will be. Uh, we shouldn't be perhaps uh, distracted by you no know, uh, smaller events uh, here and there, but uh, try to look at the the bigger picture. It is interesting what happened uh, you know, a few weeks ago uh, with uh, Prigozhin and and Wagner. Yes, yes. Uh, but it uh, it still is a bit bit foggy. Maybe too early to make uh, any any final conclusions about it. But I, I think what it shows that. Uh, the command, uh, control and command is maybe not uh, as yeah. robust or, or sure. solid. And what it clearly uh, showed, to me at least, is that uh, there's no sh- social contract uh, in, in Russia as, as we know it. So no accountability between the government uh, and the citizens. If you observed how, how Wagner was received down in, in Rostow. I sure. mean, it was welcomed by, by the people. They were right. cheering and right. yeah, nobody cared. Uh, it's, right. it's, it's a mercenary <laughs> group it's a, challenging right. the government. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an ex hot dog salesman and convict 
who took over the equivalent of United States Central Command, right? The Southern Command was running the war effort. It was extraordinary. And, yeah. and so, I, it, you know, it, it is very difficult to understand internally what's happening in Russia, right? You mm -hmm. see you see polls of Russians, but you know, what are they going to say, right? So yeah. because they're, they're constantly under duress. There are more political prisoners in, in Russia than there were during the height of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. There are more people in the international inter, internal security apparatus for Putin than there are in his armed forces. Mm -hmm. But from your vantage point, and I know a, a long student of Russia, what, what can you tell our viewers about what you see happening inside of Russia uh, in, in recent years, right? Since, since the, especially the reinvasion of Ukraine in February of 22. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on Russia, but uh, of course we have a long history with them and uh, we have observed how the Russian society has evolved. And um, my kind of short conclusion is that the, Russia is a country of a reversed uh, accountability, which is like a little bit of uh, Orwellian, uh, like. George, George Orwell, 1984, and Animals Farm, yeah. that the, the people are accountable to the parliament, and the parliament is accountable to the president, not the other way uh, right. around. No, that's so, a great way to put it. Yeah. So you don't have a, a civil society or, or free media, critical media, which is uh, like um, driving the, the political uh, processes. You don't have a rule of law, which you can turn to if you have been mistreated. It's basically power which uh, decides. Uh, yeah. Right. And what do you see? The, how do you see the power dynamics shifting after the Prigozhin revolt? Right. It, it did seem to me to at least remove the air of invincibility mm -hmm. around Vladimir Putin. But as as you know, you know the my my old interlocutor there was Patrushev, and he and others. Uh, of this hyper-nationalist, revanchist class are really have a worldview that seems to me to be quite similar to Putin in terms of yeah. his obsession with restoring the Russian empire, restoring Russian national greatness. I, I know there are some really courageous opposition leaders in prison, many others in, in exile. Um, I, I know it's very hard, it's impossible to say, but of course what many people are discussing these days is how does, how does Russia evolve? I mean, does it, does it, does it become a country ever do you see that, that would see that its future lies in a peaceful relationship yeah. with Europe and the integration with Europe? That's always been the hope for. So Finland, Finland has you know, been sitting next to Russia for 600 years. So yeah. what is your 600 year perspective on that question? Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit hesitant to make any, any, any predictions, but maybe hi history can, can show us uh, something. And uh, I mean, our history, uh, national history, is very much tied uh, into the Russian uh, history. So what we have observed in 1917 was uh, the Russian Revolution, which uh, you know, created uh, the Soviet Union. Um, it wasn't a democracy, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Soviet Union in 1991 collapsed uh, uh, and resulted into, into something else, uh, the, the current Russia which really never evolved into a, a Western-style uh, democratic uh, society. So, I mean, you can maybe draw some conclusions uh, from, from that. And by the way, all these uh, three, two or three uh, years, which I, I mentioned, 1917, 1991, and now uh, 2022, for us, they have meant a change as well, because the chaos in, in Russia has uh, opened a window or created uh, uh, circumstances where we have had the need to, to act. So first was independence, uh, second was EU integration, and third was uh, NATO. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what comes next. Uh, where, well, uh, where, where can we join uh, <laughs> after EU and NATO? Well, so you're a long-serving European diplomat. Your, your next posting is going to be in Berlin. So maybe let's talk about, about NATO and Europe and what you think the priorities ought to be for, for the EU and NATO uh, for the future. And, and, uh, and of course, Putin got the opposite of what he wanted, right, with the reinvasion of Ukraine. He thought NATO was going to splinter. He thought that, the, that Europe would be weakened. Quite opposite has happened. So we should, be, we should be happy about that. But of course, there's a lot more work to be done. And, 
And so what, what do you think the priorities ought to be for those organizations? Well, I think you, you pointed um, to a very important uh, observation, which is uh, the strategic uh, mistake uh, uh, Russia has committed by launching this aggression on, on Ukraine. Uh, I try to paraphrase uh, President Biden, uh, who at the previous NATO summit in Madrid said that uh, with the aggression on Ukraine, uh, Russia tried to Finlandize uh, Europe, but instead it NATOized uh, Finland and, and Sweden. So instead of uh, uh, getting rid of NATO from his borders, he got more NATO uh, at, at uh, his borders. And I'm talking about Putin uh, now. But there are other uh, strategic mistakes as well. I think uh, one of uh, Putin's uh, goals has been to um, influence Ukraine in such a way, uh, first uh, politically and now with the military aggression, that it would uh, not fall into the Western uh, hemisphere or <laughs> political hemisphere. Uh, in, into the NATO and, and EU, because it would uh, mean, uh, or, or as a result would, uh, would be that uh, Russia would also, uh, or the Russian people would ask, well, uh, if they do it, why don't we do it? Uh, and, and it would create a political pressure against uh, the existing Russian uh, political uh, elite. So that is, that is another point. And U Ukraine has been united. Huh? Ukraine used to be a, a divided country between Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers. Now it's uh, one country uh, fighting off the, the aggress aggressor. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, what's, what's needed for Ukraine in the long term is to be a secure and, and viable state economically. Uh, the offensive will have a lot to do with that. The, the, the counteroffensive by the Ukrainians, will they yeah. be able to to regain the territory, to ensure that viability. I think, in my opinion, that includes the Crimean Peninsula because the Crimean Peninsula, as we have seen, is, is, a, is a launching point and a logistics point for continuing the attacks on Ukraine. And I think what Putin will never be satisfied, right? He's not going to take any off-ramp he's offered. He's going to look for another on-ramp. And I think we see with the latest even missile and and drone attacks on port facilities, the you know the shutting down of the of the of the grain deal. It seems as if he's determined to continue to choke Ukraine mm -hmm. out. Is there more that that uh, the European Union can do? Yeah, the United States can do to to help Ukraine get on that yeah. path uh, to security. To, I mean, yeah. to like Finland, right? Or you know, the other examples that have been used are like South Korea or mm -hmm. uh, or Israel, mm -hmm. uh, countries that have hostile, difficult neighbors. Yeah, uh, live in in generally insecure environments, uh, less secure than, than many other countries, uh, but have been quite successful. Yeah. No, I, I think the Russian aggression has uh, also created a, a strong unity between the United States and, and the European Union and uh, other partners. I'm talking about the Asia Pacific Four, uh, sure. uh, Korea, uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and, and Japan. Um, and we have been helping uh, Ukraine uh, a lot, uh, U.S. Uh, financially, militarily, same with the European Union. Finland has uh, allocated 1.1 billion uh, euros to Ukraine, uh, mostly in, in uh, military uh, aid, uh, 16 packages uh, altogether. Uh, the European uh, Peace Facility has been used for, for this purpose. So there are many like instruments uh, we, we can use uh, to supply uh, military and financial aid. But then I think you, you rightly pointed uh, to the question of uh, the political uh, support. And there we uh, need to discuss uh, no, Ukraine's future in, in, the, in NATO and the European Union. Uh, Ukraine was given the, the candidate status to the European Union. And at the NATO summit, summit uh, in Vilnius, 11th, uh, 12th of uh, d this month, uh, July, I think uh, NATO also drew Ukraine much closer. Uh, as close as maybe is feasible under the current conditions, right? And, and I, I know that President Zelensky was, was disappointed. Of course, he's under severe duress and his people are under severe duress, and it's understandable. But, uh, but I think it was a generally good outcome. And, 
And I think the Secretary General's done a phenomenal job. I mean, staying on even longer, you know, is is, is tremendous. So, you know, what, I, what I'd like to, to ask you then is, is, uh, is to maybe speak to Americans here, you know, because uh, we have an international audience, mm -hmm. but many Americans are skeptical about sustained commitments abroad. And you see even debates here in the United States about sustaining the commitment to Ukraine, although I believe the, there's a very strong consensus and an enduring consensus behind that. But, you know, I, I think that many Americans have, have been subjected to, you mentioned this earlier, we've been through a lot of traumas. You know, we had, you know, we had, you know, the financial crisis, we can go back that far to 2008, 2009. We had huge transitions in the global economy that left a lot of Americans behind, especially those in, in manufacturing jobs that had a lot to do with the transfer of manufacturing to China in, in particular. You, you then had, you know, uh, a number of other crises, I think maybe in some ways precipitated by social media and the advent of social media and how that those algorithms now tend to drive people apart. We had an opioid epidemic. We had COVID. I mean, so we've been through a heck of a lot. And a lot of Americans, I think, are saying, okay, why are we even concerned about what's going on overseas? Let's get our own, you know, act together yeah. here. And but what would you say to the to those who are skeptical about uh, about sustained commitments abroad? Yeah. No, yeah, no. Good, good question. Um, first, I would encourage everybody to to look at the history again. We have the experience of the the first world war where. The United States uh, joined uh, the war in 1917 uh, after three years of, of the war, uh, saved uh, of, uh, Europe. Uh, then you have the Second World War again, uh, US uh, jo joining uh, late, but uh, again saving uh, Europe. So I think this uh, should be one you know, guideline. Uh, to to study, and the second is perhaps uh, to the defense of of uh, our common uh, values. Uh, I mean, after the Second World War, after so much uh, sacrifice, um, we agreed on on uh, the international order, uh, which should be uh, respected. Uh, and not be superseded by uh, totalitarianism or kind of anarchy. And I, I think this is very much uh, the situation that should we give in now, should we settle for, for certain concessions uh, which would violate uh, Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity or sovereignty, we would compromise on, on our own values very severely. and. This would set a precedent, maybe for others who have uh, you know, ideas uh, about uh, territorial adjustments. And I, I think that is a very dangerous uh, uh, path. Huh? So basically, I'm, this is already a cliche uh, to say, but I think it's important to, to repeat that Ukraine actually is is fighting for us. Uh, they are fighting for 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 our values. Uh, yeah. Right. I do think the analogy can be overused, but Poland in 1939 does come to mind for yeah. me. You know, and yeah. and uh, and the, I think the uh, the argument also is you know that of course you know, this is quite different from Finland's close proximity to your security challenges on your border, but for Americans, I think we've learned that problems and challenges to our security that develop abroad can only be dealt with. At an exorbitant cost once they reach our shores, and yes. and I think in particular about the importance of deterring conflict or now restoring peace mm -hmm. in Europe. You know, one of the concerns has been escalation. I'd like to ask you about your concerns about about escalation vertically and horizontally. Uh, but of course, we wouldn't be talking about escalation if the war didn't start to begin with, right? Yeah. If there had been, I think, the strength there uh, in Ukraine uh, and, and in Europe broadly, and with the United States, a perception of strength that had led maybe Putin to conclude he could not accomplish his objectives mm -hmm. in Ukraine at an acceptable cost. But, but could I ask you about these, these con other concerns, arguments about the sustained commitment have to do with, with uh, fears of escalation? And how do you, how do you think about that? And, and of course, how about horizontal escalation? We have a Bulgarian election coming up in 2024. 
We've seen what Russia's done in Georgia already, the problems that they create in Transdenistria. You have mm -hmm, long mm -hmm. service in Southeastern Europe, and you've seen how Russia's been stoking Serbian nationalism there. Uh, yeah. So, so what, what are we not talking about maybe in these areas that we ought to maybe consider and, and, and try to prevent? Yeah, I think well, <sighs> the points you made, they are very much related to the, the question of uh, Ukraine's uh, future as a member of, of NATO. And um, I mean, this is not an official pos position of my, my government, but uh, I'm just uh, maybe referring to to some uh, ideas and thoughts uh, which have been uh, raised. And, and one idea goes back to, uh, to Germany after the war, uh, Second World War, uh, when Germany was divided, but Western Germany uh, still uh, uh, joined uh, NATO. And the question of Eastern Germany was, was put, put aside. And uh, indeed, uh, after no, for 40 years, uh, the problem uh, solved, uh, solved itself uh, uh, pretty, pretty much. I'm not saying that this would work one-to-one, uh, -one, uh, but I think we, we need to be uh, creative in, in our thinking. And uh, we shouldn't allow um, you know, an outsider, in, in this case uh, Russia, uh, to uh, determine or limit our, our actions. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and how about your concerns uh, geographically uh, if, in terms of geopolitical mm -hmm. threats that Russia can still pose elsewhere in Europe? Of course. Uh, I mean, uh, the, they are now very much occupied uh, in, in, in Ukraine, uh, but uh, it will take them maybe four or five uh, years to, to recover. And uh, uh, then we will you know, need to, to deal that with that situation. But at the moment, uh, I, I don't think if you're referring to, to our uh, part of the, the world, the you know, northeastern uh, corner of, of NATO, we are not feeling a, a physical uh, threat uh, uh, now, which is, of course, uh, very good. Huh? Right, yeah. right. And so I'd like to ask you just a final question about uh, what you'd like to say to Americans about, about Finland uh, about uh, maybe any Americans who might <laughs> want to visit Finland, which as I'm going to soon, <laughs> and uh, and and uh, and what they should know about your culture and Nordic culture and 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 how that could maybe uh, you know help us enrich our own lives here in the United States. Well, I think the thank you for for giving me this commercial uh, <laughs> slot, but uh, I'm not going to abuse it. Um, I mean, there, there are certain stereotypes uh, maybe in, in in the U.S. about Finland. It's uh, everybody's they are all, good good every, stereotypes. Everybody's so. always in the sauna. Apparently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sauna, Santa Claus. We paid our debt. Uh, we we fought uh, the Winter War, um, but. This is part of our history, which we are very proud of, but uh, there's also a new Finland, which is uh, technology. It's a very safe uh, a country. It's a rule of law country. There's no corruption. And it's the happiest country of the world. It is. Right. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not making this up. Uh, no. it's, it's a Columbia uh, University survey. For the fifth consecutive year, we are the happiest country of the, the world. If you ask uh, the average Joe in the street, he probably uh, denies it, but uh, this is this is science. So come and invest uh, into to Finland. Come and live. Come and come and visit. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting place. Uh, yeah. Well, well, Kai Zauer, I can't thank you enough for being with us on Battlegrounds, and and I could have been a more timely discussion with <laughs> Finland and maybe soon uh, Sweden uh, entering NATO. And congratulations on your posting to Berlin, and and it was just a, a true pleasure to have you here at Hoover and. Stanford University. Thank you so much. Thank you, HR. Thank you. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we generate and promote ideas advancing freedom. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.